this, this slide is kind of interesting. The, the, what you're looking at is basically the interstate highway system, and then the width of the, the red, uh, would look like arteries or something, the width of those, those are major interstates, and then the width represents the ones that, that carry the highest volume of traffic. So, like, for example, this is I-10. Uh, this one here is I-40, which is a big one. Uh, this is, yeah, I-40 goes through Amarillo and whatever. This is I-70, goes through Denver. It's pretty big in the east. This is I-90 and so on. I-85 is a real big one here. I-95, you know, I, that's I-85, that's I-81. And I was just on I-81 about three days ago, and I'm telling you, it was full of trucks. So um, what, what we propose to do in a period of not to exceed five years is essentially have a, an LNG fueling, fueling uh, um, uh, facility, which will be co-located at Pilot, Flying J's, Petro's, uh, TAs, Loves, basically those are the big five companies, um, at least one every 250 miles along the interstate highway system, which basically means no matter where you are, if you're a Class 8 driver, you can get to somewhere to fuel up, okay, with LNG, okay, and we will co-locate at these facilities, uh, just as the, the, the one in, uh, that we saw in, uh, in Salt Lake City was done, it was on essentially a, a one and a half acre pad site that was carved out of a, a Flying J truck stop, right off of the uh, intersection of, um, of uh, Interstate 15 and Interstate 80, which is a very major, you know, uh, well, it would be right here, where that little cross is, okay? Um, the stations are designed so they can, they can essentially, uh, uh, there's, there's expansion capacity built in because in the early years, you're not going to have as many customers. So like this station, for example, had four different bays. Some of the bays only had like one LNG pump and then two CNG pumps, but as the business expands, it's all pre-plumbed, so he just puts extra pumps and he puts an extra tank and he's, and he's, and he's, and he's, and he's in business. Uh, just a little explanation on the technology. What we're gonna do, which is different from Boone Pickens, uh, is we're gonna use exclusively this LNG, CNG technology. And what you do is you get, the, you get LNG from some supply source and you take it to the station. Now, Typically, and that, that, that station was kind of an odd duck because it's a flying J right in the middle of Salt Lake City. But if you're out on the highway somewhere, you don't have an LDC around, you probably don't have an interstate pipeline around, you're going to have to get that LNG there by truck, by, 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 by delivering it by, a, you know, a tanker truck. And you, any of you all that have been up and down I-45, you may have seen Clean Energy Fuels Truck, that's our competitor, Boone Pickens. He's got a, a little small liquefaction plant in a place called Willis. It's up near Conroe. It's just about a mile off the... I-45, I just north of a, um, an energy power plant and near Lake Conroe. Anyway, he goes up to, uh, they go up to, uh, to Dallas because they deliver LNG to um, the, the DART, trans, uh, some of the DART buses run on LNG, and he delivers to Cisco Foods up there. In any event, um, the tanker trucks, they look exactly like um, the tanker trucks that are used by Companies like Praxair, they, they kind of look like a, uh, they look like a, a gas tanker truck, except they're, they're completely cylindrical and they sit a little bit higher. Okay, they're kind of heavier altogether, and 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 the tank is bigger. The tank is the tank has a liquid capacity of 13,000 gallons. You never fill it to 13,000 gallons. You fill it to 10,000, and you have that 3,000 gallon space because that LNG over time is going to want to start to boil, and you've got to have space in there so that some of the molecules when they go when they go to gas, you know. The, you don't, the, the pressure within the tank doesn't go up because you have this extra space, essentially. If you left it there for weeks and weeks and weeks, eventually a little pressure relief valve, because it's really basically a thermos bottle, and eventually it's going to have to really vent that methane to the atmosphere. You don't want to do that because it's 30 times worse than CO2 as a, as a greenhouse gas. So you want to just, you want to burn it, okay? If you burn it, it's great. If you don't burn it, it's, 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 it's not good. Okay. So we're going to build 200 stations along the interstate highway system, which pretty much gives us uh, a station every 250 miles. And then, if you remember me talking about these Walmart distribution centers, and of course Target's got distribution centers, and Home Depot, and Lowe's, and so on and so on, and then all the big trucking companies, they have massive terminals, okay, uh, not everywhere, but say a company like YRC's probably got 20 terminals coast to coast where they do fueling at the terminal. So if they're currently fueling behind the fence, if, there's, if, they're, if they are providing on their own diesel at a location, then that's a location where we want to come in and put LNG behind their fence, okay, and make it very attractive for them to switch their fleet over over time so that their whole fleet will run on LNG, okay? So we anticipate that within a four to five year period, 
there'll be between four to 500 of those locations. So now you've got 250 locations along the interstate highway and four to 500 locations that are literally behind, you know, in people's own facilities dedicated to their fleets. That ought to get the job done. Okay. So let's see. What is the job? Well, our mission, our, our and this kind of got all jumbled here, but uh, our mission is to displace a million barrels a day of imported crude within five years. Uh, personally, I think we can do more than that, but, you know, a million is a nice round number I felt kind of comfortable with. You know, I'm kind of sandbagging, and I think we can do two million. Um, and I've already said how we're going to do that as far as building the stations along the interstate highways and the behind the fence places. Um, and we've already gone over the benefits, you know, it's domestically produced, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, you know, all of that. Okay. Um, now. You may wonder, like, how much gas, how much natural gas would a million barrels a day displacement be? Well, the answer, if you assume that 80% of what we sell is going to be LNG or CNG for diesel-powered vehicles, because the, 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 there's, for every million BTUs of natural gas, that's equal to 8 gallons equivalent of gasoline, 7.2 gallons equivalent of diesel. So you, in order to determine how much gas, you have to kind of make an assumption as to what the product mix is. So we'll just say conservatively it's, it's going to be mostly tractor-trailer trucks and, and some uh, gasoline vehicles. So, uh, so it, it, if it's a million barrels a day and 800,000 of those is a displacement of diesel, that's 4.5 BCF a day. Okay? If 20% of that million barrels is displacement of gasoline, that's 1.1 uh, BCF a day. The total is 5.6 BCF a day. Well, we've heard people earlier today talk about we're going to 75 BCF, and I guess Aubrey McLennan even said we could go to 90 if we could sell it all. So I say at least that first 5.6, we got to keep it home and not even think about exporting it if we can create this demand. You know, if we still got some left over after we've filled up every car, every car and truck that wants to get it, then you can export the rest. Okay, and for a while we'll probably do that, but but hopefully. We will get to where we're burning. We're, we're the, only, the only thing we even consider exporting is what we haven't used for our own purposes, okay, to make our air cleaner and fatten our wallets, okay, and create jobs for a bunch of people. Okay, next slide. How much will all that cost? Well, you'd be amazed, a lot less than what you'd think. Um, we're looking at a capex of about $2.5 million per station, um, the ones that are along the interstate highways. And then the ones that are behind the fence are quite a bit cheaper. They're about a million and a half a piece. So that's about $500 million for the ones on the highway. And depending upon the number that we do and behind the fence, it's somewhere between four and $600 million for that. Now, that is strictly getting the fuel to the vehicles, okay? I haven't said anything about, the, about where we get the LNG, and that's a very important part. So that's my next slide, okay? Um, now, just a basic question I should have put on this thing. You know, why should we export LNG and import crude oil? It doesn't make any sense. I think the answer to me is keep the LNG at home and use it, okay? Don't export it, use it. And then if you've got some left over, then you can export that, okay? So how are we going to do this? Well, first, there, you know, everybody knows these maps, and there's maps of all the ones that you know, dream projects, but these are the ones that are already existing. And some of these already have truck loading terminals. Some of them do not. Uh, some of them are applying to, to redo their truck loading terminals, like Elba Island, because the truck loading terminals they had there were built in the 70s, and they're just not, they're not good enough. Um, but basically, we're looking at uh, being able to, to truck LNG out of the Cannon Port facility up in, up in the Maritimes. District Gas already has huge truck loading. They deliver prodigious quantities of LNG. Um, to LDCs in the area. There's some LDCs up there that have peak shaving units that were built in the 70s, and it's actually cheaper for them to buy LNG from district gas, have it trucked over there and put in their tank than it is to operate their own equipment to, you know, to pull the gas off the pipeline. Because the equipment's so old, it's just not as efficient. So they got plenty, and they want to sell us plenty more. And they're about ready to do a big expansion, so, you know, that's not a problem. Code Point, well, it's already been discussed earlier, some of the problems they're having. The problem they're having is they're not moving enough gas. Well, we can move lots of gas, you know, and, 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 and from Cove Point, Maryland, we can serve a very large area, okay, and help solve some of their problems, okay? And if they would just put a uh, liquefaction unit, it doesn't take a huge one to export, just the one to solve that liquids problem, 
we could be making LNG by pulling gas off the pipeline all the time and just loading them on our trucks and just driving on out there. So we're solving their problem and we're creating our supply. Uh, Elba Island, well, El Paso's already working on a project to do exactly what I'm talking about. They have a, a funny knack of stepping all over their own feet. They're, they've kind of got everybody all up in arms in, in Savannah. Some people in Savannah think that LNG trucks are actually more dangerous than diesel or gasoline tanker trucks. You know, it's because El Paso's done a horrible job of communicating the message. But, you know, be it as may. Lake Charles just as, uh, just indicated that they're going to apply for an export license. Okay. Uh, everybody knows about, I don't know why it's not on here. This must be the old map, Jordan. But uh, the Chenier, you know, Sabine Pass isn't on here. Uh, the Chenier project is not on here, but they, they, they have obviously applied for export license, as has um, Freeport. Now, the only problem is Freeport is kind of weird if you've ever been down to that, that location. It's going to be a little difficult to get the tanker trucks on that little island, but um, it, it can be done. It's like a peninsula, but they don't have an adequate road, so, but that's not a, you know, a, a life-threatening problem. Okay. Um, other ways. Okay, don't do this slide yet. Other, other ways. Um, there, as Tom mentioned earlier, talking about the cryogenic uh, natural gas liquids processing plants. Well, you know, the cryogenic processes kind of came on, I think, what, in the 80s? And, and that's pretty much, if it's a large-scale gas processing plant these days, that's pretty much how they do it. Okay. And so you're spending all this energy to make the gas cold the gas stream coal that has the liquids entrained so the liquids will drop out at a, at a pre-described temperature. You know, it, it, you know, this one drops out at this temperature and so on and so on. So what you end up on the tail end is, 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 is dry gas that's very cold. Okay, now what they do right now is they take that dry gas and very cold, since it's already cold, and they basically loop it back through the process so you don't lose the thermal benefit, all the energy that it took to make it cold enough to make that last liquid drop out. You know, you want to take that coal gas and bring it all the way back around the front end, and then you don't need as much energy to get to the cold, to, to, to the temperature to make the first liquid drop out on the front end, okay? Well, because it's already cold, we don't have to make it that much more cold to make gas LNG drop out. So, so it's like, look, we will compensate you for the energy that you would lose by not returning this loop, and we'll make LNG here. We'll put in a little LM2500 here to run off, to basically run your whole plant super cheap. And, you know, when the ERCOT goes to $1,500 a megawatt hour, everybody have an agreement, hey, stop making liquids for a while, we'll stop making LNG, let's just make electricity for four hours because we can make all kinds of money, and then we'll split that, you know. And so it's basically a big option. It's a real option. It's a bunch of real options here. But the whole point is because they've expended all this energy, which they're currently right now, they're, they're not getting as cheaply as we can make it for them, okay. But... Uh, you basically will create this optionality with the power plant, make the LNG cheaper than anybody else, include, including Ben Pick, uh, Boone Pickens. Um, but when the electricity prices go crazy, everybody will stop doing what they're doing for a very short period of time. These are only talking about four to eight hour intervals, you know, super peak or something in, you know, on a summer day. And as long as you have tankage that's big enough, you can store, you know, the product that you're not making during that time. You just, you just have your tankage a uh, little supersized so that you never run out of product because you know, you're making a little, you're making that product all the time, but when you can really make big money selling electricity, you're going to run that, that gas turbine selling just electricity. Um, but we will actually lower their overall cost of production by selling them electricity from this gas turbine that we're going to put on, okay, than what they've got now. All right, and then another one which I really can't discuss uh, because of some uh, non-disclosure agreements, but there's another process that um, it's even more whiz-bang than the one I just mentioned. Uh, and essentially, um, it's a global opportunity. It's, it's, a, it's an industrial process that lends itself very well to hooking up with LNG uh, manufacturer and on a cost basis that's just unbelievable. So uh, almost as cheap as, you know, shells make it in these big, massive LNG trains. 